I have just, maybe I will just skip here or should I just tell like, okay, resampling is, uh, as it is called, uh, sampling it again. So we have a training set and we take a part of it and we calculate the mean squared error and we want to estimate the uh, test error rate. So um, what happens? One thing uh, it's, I mean, one disadvantage, maybe we would tell that uh, it's not using the entire original training sample. So uh, this might cause some um, mis not miscalculations, not miscalculations, but uh, not estimating correctly for the um, test error. Uh, what else? So resampling is computationally expensive. Why? Because we are sampling more than one time and we need to calculate everything again and again. And it is the um, computationally expensive part. And model assessment uh, is the evaluating a model's performance and model selection is the selecting uh, level of flexibility. And I will continue. So cross-validation, uh, what do we do? We have a training data and uh, we want to estimate the test error rate. And yeah, I suppose I don't have anything to say for here, but let's continue with the validation set approach. So here um, we want to estimate the test error rate. So we separate uh, our observations into two parts as training and the validation set. It, validation set is also called, out, called as uh, holdout set. And um, Normally, when we are um, calculate when we are calculating the test error rate directly, we need the whole training set. Uh, but for the, I mean, for cross validation and for the validation part, we separate them and we uh, use the training set, training of the, I mean, training set of the training set, and. Uh, we by we uh, fit our model to our like subset of training set, and we um, try to predict the observations in validation set. So this way, we try to estimate the test error rate. And here is the um, like diagram for that. What happens? We shuffle it, and we uh, cut it into two parts, like from the middle, and we take one part as training and the other part as validation, and we try to estimate the um, test error rate. Then, um, so we will check this figure, but my notes are here. I mean, it's not my notes, it's just uh, what written, what's written in the book. Then it says that uh, the quadratic term I mean, the mean squared error uh, is dramatically smaller uh, for quadratic polynomial equation than the linear equation. So this shows that linear equation is not adequate to fit the data. And after the quadratic term, uh, when we continue to increase the order of polynomial terms, uh, we don't have much more benefits. So they just go like very similar. So when we increase the degree of polynomial, it means that we need more computation. And um, what happens, even though we use more power for the computation, we do not get better uh, results. So. That, that means that uh, a second degree, a quadratic polynomial would be enough, I suppose. Then it says that uh, different test mean squared error estimates. So uh, when we use different degrees of polynomials for each of like each trial, 
we have different uh, mean squared errors uh, for, I mean, so here they, we see 10 of the, I suppose it's 10, 10 of the, um, 10 of the, leave one up, did we start leave one? No, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh -huh. Okay, we do it 10 times, so we shuffle and do it again, shuffle and do it again. So each time the uh, content of training and validation sets change, and what happens, we obtain different mean, mean squared errors, and uh, this shows us that uh, this does not, I mean, when we do it just once, we cannot be sure that it is really close to the real one. So we see that um, when we just um, divide the training set into training set and uh, validation set, we cannot be sure that it is really the correct one. So this might require like do it again and again and again and uh, just take the um, mean and it might be something else that we will see in the um, further ones uh, what else i can say so we can say that we cannot see here a consensus for uh, different um valid cross validation yeah, validation set approach for different validation set approach trials yes then um so as a conclusion for this part, we can say that here we see they are highly variable and uh, it depends on what is in the training set and what is in the validation set. So, um, so it's highly variable, yeah. And um, we can say that since we divided into two parts, we only use a subset of observations, like subset of the training set to fit the model. And since when we use fever observations, we can not get good enough uh, performance. And uh, generally, validation set error rate may tend to overestimate the test error rate because we don't use the entire data set. So when we do our training, it's not have enough um, like data. And since we use half of the training set as validation set, generally uh, the error rate is bigger than the real test error rate. Then leave one out. Uh, we just do it by uh, excluding one of them. And we do it uh, n times. If we say that we have n observations, we repeat this part n times. And what we do is that let's assume that we excluded this. So the blue part is training set and the pinkish one is uh, validation. So by using all this part, we try to um, predict this one by using the others. And this is actually kind of good. However, it requires, since we do it like n times, if we, if we have, a thousand of observations, then we will repeat this process like a thousand times. So it's too much. Anyways, uh, it says that it's approximately unbiased. That's kind of true because in each of, not kind of, it's really true. Anyways, uh, each of validation set, we have only one observation. So it's really like it's kind of it's kind of impossible to be biased, and 
still, even though it's unbiased, we can obtain a poor estimate, estimate uh, because each time uh, we try to uh, estimate just one observation and we can assume that if it is correct, it is, we can say that it's one. And if it is incorrect, we can say that it is zero. So um, this way it says it's highly variable. Uh, but what I was thinking like that we cannot make it like uh, this much correct. Yeah, we still can do it by using the, taking the average, but I don't know. Yeah, it says that it's highly variable. We can also, um, anyways, sorry, 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 let's continue. Then here is the um, test, but yeah, average of uh, test error estimates. I mean, it's uh, equation to calculate it. And so the one of the advantages of leave one out cross validation is it's far less bias, and it was also written here that nearly unbiased. And uh, it tends to tends not to overestimate the test error rate. Why? Because I suppose it's because it has less bias. Uh, okay, then let's continue. And here we have another picture here, some plots and yeah, this actually looks like really similar to the other one. So uh, linear, a linear model is not adequate and the a second de degree equation is giving way better mean squared error and uh, the remained parts, I mean, the remained degrees of polynomials, they do not give us so much benefits. And here, uh, unlike the previous plot uh, for validation and set approach, we do not have that much variance. So they are always close to each other and yeah it says always yield the same results and uh, there is no randomness in the training and validation set splits because uh, we do not shuffle and cut into two parts uh, but we use like all the observations uh, once as a validation set. We use all of them once as a validation set. So there is no randomness. Then, um, yeah, it has potential to be expensive. Why? Because we are doing, uh, if we have 10,000 observations, we are doing it uh, 10,000 times. We are, we are repeating that that much. So it means that the new, uh, a huge, amount of computation so it is it might be expensive and also it is very time consuming because we are calculating it over and over and over uh, a thousand times maybe depending on our uh, observation number of observations and here we have another equation um, so this is also this is cross validation. Is it error rate? I'm not sure. But uh, I'll just move on. Sorry for that. Let's continue. Then here we see a five fold cross validation. It is like the mixture of uh, validation set approach and leave one out cross validation. So, what happens instead of um, taking one observation each time, we are uh, shuffling our uh, observations and then we are separating uh, separating them 
like we de we decide for how many pieces we will separate it and we repeat the calculation for that much so let's say it's k fold and as it is said it is k fold so we divide it into k parts and we take the first k group as validation and the remained part as um, training set and we repeat it k times then so here is the equation for mean squared errors for k fold cross validation estimates and yeah most obvious advantages computational why because for leave one out cross validation we were doing the computation n times but now we are doing the computation k times which is smaller than n then here we see the um true and estimated test mean squared errors and so when the okay let's do it uh we have black dashed line here maybe i can make the picture black dashed line and orange line which is um, tenfold cross validation black dashed line is leave one out and the blue one is why i cannot see okay ah oh, yeah 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 the true mean squared error is blue then so we can see that leave one out and tenfold cross validation they are very similar for all of them so we can say that instead of doing it like instead of compute it like a thousand times if we make the calculation 10 times we can get the same uh, performance with less computation and for different cases we can we can observe them here um so these are i suppose not different data but like different cases and for different cases so we, we try that we compare leave one out and tenfold cross validation so we can have the same um performance and we have uh, that crosses here so those are minimum of like minimum points of mean squared error curves and we can compare their closeness so we might say that they are a bit uh, far from each other here i mean the true minimum and estimated minimums and we can say that here they are totally same not totally but super close in my opinion but yeah i suppose even these are not so far from each other okay then we can say that um tenfold is much more feasible because why we like computationally it's much more feasible and so we can also compare fivefold and tenfold um oh, only one second yeah okay we will compare it here then let's continue what else we can say mm. So
So we want to um, okay, when we have the cross, I mean when we perform the cross validation, we want to estimate the actual test mean squared error. But uh, if we do not need like actual result, uh, the minimum point in the estimated test mean squared error is enough, I suppose. Yeah, so um, Yeah. Okay. So, uh, if we want to know how well the procedure is, like how is it, how close it is to the reality, the actual estimate of the test mean squared error is important. But the other times, only the location of the minimum point is enough. So, um, so, uh, so we can perform cross validation on like different studies statistical learning methods or on a single method using different levels of flexibility to identify the that results in the post test error. So, um, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we can um, try to find the best method in, in many statistical learning methods. Maybe we are looking for the best method, or maybe we are looking for the best flexibility level and yeah we can go like both ways to reach the lowest test error yeah we can try them both or maybe we can uh, look for the best statistical learning method first and then we can look for the best level of flexibility, maybe. And, and let me check here, here. So it says that uh, in figure five, six, despite they sometimes underestimate the true test mean squared error, all of the cross validation curves come close to identifying the correct correct level of flexibility. And that is the smallest test mean squared error. So so I suppose it means that our uh, small means on the in the nearly the same has nearly the same flexibility. Maybe I can see that. Okay, and let's continue. Then bias variance trade off for 
K fault cross validation. So K is smaller than N. So this is the computational advantage to leave one out cross validation. And K fault is uh, often gives it gives often a more accurate estimate estimates of the test error rate. Mm. Hmm. Okay, I am thinking here that um, I suppose it's because in leave one out, uh, we exclude one of observations each time. So as it was saying here, it is a poor estimate. And since the estimation is like each time we make the estimation uh, by using a single observation. So because of that, maybe we can say that um, yeah, when we use a group of uh, valid, like a group of observation for validation, so maybe because of that, it gives us more accurate estimate estimates than um, leave one out cross validation and. So in each training set in k fold cross validation, we have k minus one multiplied by n over k observations. So we divide n observations to k, then we take one of uh, one of them uh, as the validation and the remained part. So K minus one of this amount is training set. So uh, we have a fever, like a smaller training set than leave one out cross validation. Um, however, we have a bigger validation. Okay, it was a good idea to turn off my video. Okay, okay. And I suppose my connection is still bad, but I suppose it's better than before. Okay, can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Thank you. Then I was here uh, and if, I'm, I mean, if I lost my connection before here, then please tell me. Otherwise, I will continue here. So I was telling that if we want to, so if we uh, want to, yeah, if we want to reduce the bias, then leave or not cross validation is preferred to K fault. Why? Because in uh, leave one out cross validation, it was telling that, I mean, it was uh, approximately unbiased. So, uh, yeah, we can say that um, for the bias reduction, uh, leave or not cross validation is, is uh, preferred to K fault. Yeah. And then it says that leave one out cross validation has higher variance than K fault cross validation has. Why? Because for, um, for each of uh, each small validation set, uh, actually, we, I cannot say that we have uh, different uh, results 
because we don't have the different results, but maybe uh, for careful cross validation, since we have a little bit bigger validation set than leave one out cross validation, maybe that is the uh, that's why maybe uh, we have less variance for k fold cross validation. Mm, yeah. Then on classification problems, um, so so we instead use the number of misclassified observations. Uh, okay. Past the best part. I'm sorry. So this is done again for cross validation, and so here the uh, predicted, like estimate, estimate of. Uh, value for an observation is not to so i suppose i'm gonna just skip here i'm sorry for that okay let's check here hmm. maybe i'm not good at at this part so we have okay we have different polynomials so the purple one is the um, bias decision boundary and for all of them like it's like a reference that we compare um, bias decision boundary with our different degrees of logistic regression so degree one is the linear regression and we see how different it is than the the purple dashed line and for the quadratic polynomial quadrat quadratic logistic regressions so it's at least it's better than linear regression and for uh, cubic and quartic ones in my opinion they i mean when we increase the flexibility um it's not giving us like so much benefits i could say and here is the test error rates for them so the first one the error rate was 0 0.2 and the quadratic one 0 0.197 and the cubic one 0 0.16 and quartic one it's 0 0.162 so we can say that between three and four, as we also see on the picture, we do not get uh, better estimates. Uh, like not better, but um, uh, just like the previous plots, then the flexibility was increasing or let's show here, when the degree of polynomial was increasing, uh, the mean squared error is like, uh, does not uh, get smaller, like uh, we cannot have a significant reduction, say. And let's continue. <laughs> And let's see. So here we can see the error rates and order of polynomials used. And the brown line is the test error. And the blue line is the training error. 
and black one is tenfold um, cross validation. So, uh, like we saw uh, on previous chapters, the training error tends to decrease when we train more. We have, I mean, it gets, I mean, it, it learns better and it tends to reduce. But in the, in test error, um, when we, uh, I mean, until some polynomials, uh, it decreases, but then test error starts to increase. And we can see that for tenfold cross-validation, we can see that uh, it is more similar to the test error. And, mm -hmm. So this is here. This is left logistic regression using polynomial functions of the predictors and KNN classifier with different values of K, the number of neighbors used in the KNN classifier. So this is K nearest neighbors. Yeah. And yeah, I'm gonna continue. Then, um, so cross validation error curve slightly underestimates test error rate, even though that it takes on a minimum very close to the takes on a minimum very close to the best value for k. Yeah, okay. Then now it's now we can talk about the bootstrap. Then uh, this can be used to quantify the uncertainty and hmm, so we can assume that we invest a fixed sum of money into financial asset. And let's say that alpha to the to uh, alpha of our money into x and the remained part, so one minus alpha into y then we want to choose alpha to minimize the total risk of variance. So here are the calculations and not calculations, but let's say uh, like formulas. And this is like, um, so the, yeah, there are some equations, but it's not, let's just forget that I just got confused for a moment. Then we have unknowns as standard deviations and variances and covariance, I suppose. And then uh, we can estimate the value of alpha that minimizes the variance. And we have this part as a question in uh, exercises part, but it's something else. Then let's say that um, we have a hundred paired observations of X and Y's, um, but we repeat the process for a thousand times. And 
we will okay i hope i am with you still because my connection is unstable so uh then we will obtain a thousand estimate estimates for alpha and here what we see so a hundred simulated returns for investments x and y um so resulting estimates for alpha from left to right and top to bottom so this one is 0 0.576 here is 0 0.523 and here is 0 0.657 and here is 0 0.651 so these are the estimates for alpha. Mm. Dun, dun, dun. And the mean for all thousand estimates for alpha is calculated here which is 0 0.59, like nearly 0 0.6. So these four are like uh, like the mean of these four, we can say. And then, and here the standard deviation of the estimates. And okay, then, here we see uh, the here is the histogram of the estimates of alpha and for a thousand simulated data sets from the true population and in the center we see another histogram uh, from a thousand bootstrap samples from a single data set. So while here we have a thousand simulated data sets from true population, and here 1000 bootstrap samples from a single data set. And so we can compare them. And so we can just assume that Mm, we let's assume that these are like mountains and we are looking from the top like looking them from above and we can see them like these and the purple lines purple line is also here and so pink line indicates the true value of alpha and this is the true population and this is the bootstrap and both of them are 0 0.6 alphas are 0 0.6 um what can we say about it uh dun, 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 dun. So I suppose for the true uh, population, I face close to the mean. But for the bootstrap, alpha is higher than the mean, maybe. Not mean, median? I'm not sure right now. I'm getting confused. Then here we have the standard error for estimated alpha. And I suppose this picture should be even earlier to, because this shows us the i mean this is for me 
it is the logic of bootstrap. So we can assume that we have three observations and we have X and Y values for them. And so this is the original data, but for, uh, uh, for by using this original data, we can uh, obtain different, um, different data sets. And I can say that this is the bootstrap. And uh, in by using this much data, we can have lots of other data. No, no, yeah, data. So uh, we can see that we have the first observation in here, and we have the third observation two times. So it can repeat and their um, order can change, but only the observation is the same. So it, first observation is 4.3 for X and 2.4 for Y, and it will continue to be like that, but we can have the um, like different, like we, create, uh, we can like, it looks like we create data from original data. So I'm sure that between here, I mean, in here, there are uh, data sets as, I mean, uh, comprised of just the first observations three times. So each bootstrap, bootstrap data set contains n observations, like three here. Uh, so they are sampled from the original data set. And each bootstrap data set is used to obtain an estimate of alpha. So this way, we can uh, try to estimate estimate uh, alpha like for the same data set, but not the same data set for different of them, like different data sets of alpha. So I suppose so. Then the, then the lab starts. So, um, do you have questions? Because I am not confident that I am explaining things well, because I can also get uh, confused and, yeah. Do you have questions that we can discuss about those? Nope. Then maybe we can, look for labs for a while. By the way, I'm not, I mean, we don't have that much time, only seven minutes, but maybe we can just start a little bit. So this is my RStudio session. And I am not good at tidy models. I don't know tidy models that much, but uh, what we can do is that, by the way, I can check. Uh, oh, thank you, Rose. Thank you, Rose. You're the best. Thank you. Anyways, then, um, yeah, here we can sample, let's say, from 1 to 392. We can sample half of it randomly. And we can say that this is our training, uh, train data set, let's say. So by using the set seed, uh, even someone else would uh, work this code. It will give the same training set because the seed is set now. Then this is the validation set approach. 
Why? Because it shuffles the data. It shuffles the numbers from one to 392 and it takes half of it. And this is our training set and the remained part would be validation set. Then uh, in the base R, linear model fit, I suppose this is. Um, so it might change in tidy models, which I do not know many things about it. Uh, but maybe since we can, I cannot uh, have all of them in this session, I don't think that I can finish it in this session. Uh, maybe. Well, on the next presenter, you can take some. You can do this next week and then I'll continue after yours. Okay, I suppose that's better because we have only five minutes. I was thinking that maybe I can go a little bit, uh, but yeah, a little bit will not be anything, I suppose. I think we can continue next week and then like last time, we'll, then I'll start my, my, my part after you're done. Uh, okay, so uh, I will try my best to make it quick in the uh, in the next week so I don't I mean I will try take as less as possible from your time okay so then thank you I suppose we will continue next week And uh, yeah, I will stop sharing my screen. Yeah. Thank you very much for listening to me. Yay. <laughs> okay, so see you next week. Bye.